Nick, you're a legend. It feels like we Dude, actually met in like Pas- Pasadena. Do you remember that? Very briefly, you definitely oh, don't. Oh, yeah, 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 the upfront thing. In the, we were doing, yeah. you were doing press for the great with Hulu, and I remember that we were in the same room, and I got into the lift with Lauren, and I was like, fuck, that's, that's Nick Holt, and here we are, chatting about acting. And I things. do remember that room, because I was so hungry by that point, I was like, oh, God, God, oh. to eat. Hi, Paul. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to do an introduction anyway. Um, tell me about uh, Normal People, how you first came across the script or the book and uh, which one you read first and, and how it came about. Yes. So it, um, I was doing a play in Dublin at the time and uh, it, it's probably not the most of exciting stories in terms of like it wasn't, I was aware of the book, hadn't read it, but um, it came through kind of as most auditions through, through my agent. I got the sides and kind of discovered quite quickly that it was based on the book and devoured the book as quickly as I could. And then, um, yeah, it was kind of a fairly standard audition process, like one with the casting director. And then I met Lenny Abrams and the director at the callbacks. Then there was that kind of horrible Christmas hiatus mid audition period when you're like, you feel like you're on a roll with it. And then you find out it's going to be a two, three week hiatus. And then um, it was straight into chemistry after that. But yeah, it, it was, uh, I came to the book through the audition process, really. Right, okay. And when, when, when you read a similar question for you, sorry. I was just go going ahead. to ask, when you read the book, did you, once you then got the part, did you go back and read it again? And was it very influential in terms of making the character or was a lot of what you interpreted in the script? Yeah, I, I think, I, I feel like I've been spoiled with this job being my first job on screen because normally you have, for a job like this, when the, when the right producers are involved, you either have a great script, you have great source material. And I think in this case, I was really fortunate that I had both. So through it obviously there was a point in which the scripts became uh, a priority for me because that's ultimately the thing that you're going to be playing on the day on set but it would, the, the book was kind of a constant companion throughout like i would normally read the scenes in the book again uh, like the morning of that we would be shooting something just because i think the tr- the trick with normal people for me was that in the book you obviously got all these massive interior monologues and and things like that whereas in the script they had chosen that that's not going to be the case so I it was trying to place those inner monologues like like root them in the character so then when you're playing the scenes without those things that you feel like you're or you pray to God that it's going to percolate through on the day right and is that something so I'm interested in this because I, I, I haven't figured out how I go about the process of getting into characters mm-hmm. and stuff particularly so I'm always like wanting to learn from people but would you kind of put the notes onto your script, like in between, like the thoughts from the book, and so that when you're reading the lines, and and that's a, another question, I suppose. Would you learn the lines? Mm-hmm. Was it? Did you stay very close to the text, or was there a lot of improvising? Yeah. Um. So I, I'm not the most like neat of workers, so I was kind of hoping that I'd just like reread and reread and reread the book so that it would percolate its way into the script. Um. And in terms of, sorry, what was the question about learning lines? Well, I just wondered if there was, if you like aligned the book, the, the inner monologues that were in the book along with the dialogue that you were saying on that gotcha. day and kind of intertwined them a little bit. So when you were learning dialogue, you kind of had them mixed in there. Yeah, I was aware. I did, I did write like page references for like, if there was a scene where there's say like four lines where in the book there was four pages, I would go, okay, go to page 76 and read through this on the day that you'd be filming it. But I, I imagine it's something, I don't know if, it, if it's similar for you, but when you start a job, you have all these great intentions about, or, or your, 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 your work prior to filming, suddenly when you're like six, seven, eight weeks in, and exhaustion starts to hit, your best intentions can sometimes be taken over by adrenaline and fatigue. And I think that's useful as well. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, in, in many ways, it's that percolating of ideas. You kind of take them all in in the prep process, and hopefully enough of them stay with you. That then, yeah, when you're tired or whatever it is, those kind of things just kind of seep through without you intentionally having to like reach for them and put them in. And so, yes, uh, totally. just to go back a second, was because I I loved the tone of the show and, and the performances in terms of they felt so natural and believable. Obviously, but is that something that thank you were you improvising a lot or were you sticking to the scripted pages a lot? 
Um, so yeah, the, the way Lenny worked was that he, so Sally adapted the first six, Sally Rooney adapted the first six episodes alongside Alice Birch, who's an amazing uh, playwright and, and, and screenwriter. So I, I think what the way Lenny typically likes to work is he likes to have a really, really strong working script, but he's also incredibly dexterous when you get to set in terms of like, you would rehearse a scene which on paper seems to and does really work. But there, there's a scene, for example, in um, episode six when Marion and Connell are at the pool and uh, it's basically about him having issues in, in terms of asking Marianne can he live with her because he's lost his jobs and there's all this like wonderful subtext to play and there was this gorgeous like one page scene and obviously it was one of those kind of time critical days you're you're on you're on location and you're on that location for one day and you're also freezing cold from standing in the pool all day but uh we got to that scene we were rehearsing that scene and the scene on paper really works but I remember turning to Lenny and saying I think if Connell says this to Marianne as written Marianne would kind of catch on to the fact that, and she would ask more questions about it. So I think it would, I, I had a, like myself, uh, Daisy Edgar Jones who plays Marianne, and then he had this kind of very frank discussion about how we can communicate all that without actually saying it, because they're they're both very bright characters and would be very intuitive into in terms of how each other use language. So the scene ended up being, I think, Connell sits up, kisses Marianne on the shoulder, and he says, Marianne, and she says, what? And he just says nothing. And that's like Lenny's amazing in that way that he's able to kind of take a scene that is so, like substantially written and then find the essence of the scene and boil it down to the bare bones. And that like ultimately that places a lot of trust in you and you feel really empowered as an actor that he feels right. I think you can communicate that as efficiently as possible. And also it's kind of thrilling when you're like, oh, it, it works or yeah. Well, yeah, and then as the audience, you can kind of interpret a little bit yourself and read between the yeah. lines. And that's what's great about those two characters, watching them alongside each other. The ups and downs through their, through their life and the, and the relationship, I think one of the things that I really loved was the ability to watch them communicate really well and then have complete breakdowns of that. Well, I don't really click uh, with a lot of people. I, I struggle with that, actually. Uh, here, I don't think that uh, people like me that much. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about, because one of the brilliant things about the show is how, how the two characters communicate when they're younger. Um, I guess that's a question that I also had as well, actually, is, is how you felt about playing the characters through the transition in their ages. Um, yeah. So I think, I, I'm not sure how old you are, to be honest with you, but I guess you're playing down. A little oh, yeah, bit and how, very how much you went so. about that, um, and yeah, just the yeah. example that you're setting, I suppose, for people nowadays as well. Yeah, I think like it's 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 like that kind of eighteen to um twenty three, twenty four like age bracket. I always think is like that period in anyone's life where everything emotionally and kind of physically is coming at you very thick and fast, and you kind of you're in that kind of the melting pot of like emotions and trying to figure yourself out and I think ultimately that's where Connell wrestling with himself and where he kind of fits into the world ultimately I think leads to him struggling with communicating his active wants and desires to Marianne and like I think the, the kind of commercial side of my brain is kind of thinking well that's what's good for drama it's got you've got this you've got two people placed in this really intimate and clearly very loving relationship, but they're not able to activate that in the way, even though at some points they're able to communicate perfectly and generally that would be physically, but there's the, like there's scenes where Connell apologizes and Marianne accepts it. And these things are like, they feel like such refreshing moments in a relationship that is full of like angst and kind of missed moments and missed beats. Um, I want to run back for a second. Sorry, I've got so many questions okay. to ask you and things to go on. Um, but you, when you went through the audition process, um, uh, I wanted to ask about meeting Daisy for the first time, Daisy Edgar Jones, um, and and how that was, what the what the feeling was, how you both prepped together as well. Um, was there like yeah. a rehearsal period where you got to know each other, or like based on the script, or was there just time spending together, getting to know each other? And because um, our chemistry is amazing on screen, so I just wanted to know how you guys created that. Yeah. Um 
so I met Daisy like again in 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 a kind of typical chemistry. I hadn't met Daisy before. I was kind of it was it, that was an odd experience for me actually as well. Kind of it was my first time ever being. I'd been offered the part at that point, so I was sitting in the room, not, not actively pursuing a job. And I think for me, I was like, "What is happening here?" What did you feel? What did you feel and think being on that side of, of the proceedings? Because it's weird. It, it's weird suddenly seeing it. It's so side. weird. It's, it's I I found the weird, the, the predominant thing that I felt about it was really uplifting because at that point I was like everybody who walks into this room at this point it's it, at a chemistry point are incredibly talented incredibly well prepared actors who if i wasn't playing connell would be a really good fit with somebody else but ultimately it's kind of six in one hand half a dozen in the other in the sense that like it's still pretty brutal because i could turn to them and be like that was an amazing audition but i feel like the compatibility of us as actors wouldn't work and uh, like do you know what i'm trying to say there it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. it obviously it's, it's it's a huge amount of it it's about preparation and, and and doing the work but then a lot of it's down to chance in terms of the compatibility with the other actor especially in a central relationship like that where it's going to de depend on it but when, when i met daisy i remember she she came in and i um i just remember the kind of thing that i keep saying about it was that it felt like, you know, in kind of auditions when they can be quite stilted and quite like there's lots of acting going on because there's, you're trying to show the work to a certain degree. But Daisy came in and it felt like the two characters were actually just kind of talking to each other in, in a way that felt relaxed and the, there was stuff going on between the lines. And, and ultimately, I just felt like there was a, a nice... Um, balance of energy and obviously I knew straight away that she's an astonishing actress so all those kind of things kind of felt like they were in place and it's weird because I kind of knew in the back of my head that that was who they were going to go out to for Marianne and it just kind of proves that the good instinct in that setting normally normally takes hold um yeah and then can I talk then, yeah, about your show now <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> sorry I just um I've got more things to ask so, you Karen. Um, I I finished the grade over the weekend and you are hey, thank you. amazing. Sorry for giving you so much time. No, so, you're so brilliant in it. And I think like <laughs> my main questions around this are, are, are in regards to style because it's something that a, I, ha I haven't done in that setting. And I think it's something that you've almost monopolized in terms of, in terms of the crossover between the favorite and the grade. And okay, so my first question is, and it's kind of a, a thing that I'm interested in is that from all accounts, you appear to be a really genuine, nice human being. Yet Peter, <laughs> one might argue, is not. And I, I'm curious about how you approach playing an antagonistic character like that, or whether uh, you even view him as that. It's it's difficult. I try I try not. I, I mean, from an outside point of view, I can obviously clearly see he's the antagonist of the story, and and that, and, that, yeah. um, and he does lots of terrible things. Um, but then I try try not in my mind to view him as that too much because um, I think I think with Tony McNamara's writing the brilliant thing is he he gives you this character but then he kind of gradually peels away a few layers where you start to go oh okay there's there's reasons for the way he is and I think that's yeah. the thing with with Peter he's very much someone you know he's a man child and he does horrible things and he has no understanding of other people's um, emotions or feelings and how he affects them but that's very, he, he's just living in this bu a bubble. I mean, he's, everyone's yes, yes people around him and he, he kind of is being manipulated by lots of people for their benefit. And then he also has this, you know, complex about following his father's footsteps and his mother has obviously scarred him. So there's all these things that you kind of chip away at. And then that, the brilliant thing about him is, I think the one redeemable thing, apart from his love of food, <laughs> is, um, <laughs> yeah. is, uh, He's, he's like he's like a, a stream of consciousness. He's very he's very honest and mm -hmm. direct, and I think that's kind of um, a good quality in people at times, mm -hmm. um, or something that's. I imagine very of, fun to play as well. I imagine that stream of consciousness character is the most crack imaginable. It's re it's really fun. That's I mean it's probably the most fun I've ever had. I don't know about you, but I feel like you can tell me if you think this is true. But I feel like when I'm having the most fun is when I normally do better work and, is that, and mm -hmm. 
And sometimes I'm having fun like offset with the people, but then like when it comes to work time between action and cut, it's not as much fun. But on this, I really found that the time between action and cut, like the doing the scenes was so much fun because of that character and the fact that you can kind of do anything with him. Tony gives you the perfect framework and dialogue to do it, but then you can, there's nothing you can't do that would be wrong. Yeah, reason. and I suppose my question is, is like, I don't know, uh, like in, in regards to kind of period dramas, is that I feel personally in, in some instances they can feel slightly stilted if they're not talking about or commenting on themes that are present today and that's what I think really works about the great person is that it's like it's totally it's it's biographic almost it, it's playing with the style but it's also commenting on themes that we are directly experiencing in terms of like potential leaders that are globally around the world today and was that something that you were interested in commenting on or were you did you did you want for an audience to project that onto it or is that a theme that you're interested in kind of discussing in general it's definitely something I'm interested in in discussing and something that I think when it's viewed through that microscope mm. you can kind of it's easier to palette and understand and kind of for people to yeah. just see it in, uh, in that viewpoint um, but I wasn't when making the character up or like I wasn't pinpointing people and being like oh I'm gonna directly affiliate yeah, yeah. to that person that's who I'm gonna try and and so like people have obviously compared him to political leaders and whatever but there were like some celebrities that I based it on some political leaders and just people that I was like okay um I feel as though they're kind of this sort of yeah. person this is mother I would not bury her I could not bear the thought of never seeing her she is pretty Mother, this is Catherine. It is my honour. When you're preparing for any role, for example, is it, do you try to attach it to people that you see, or or was it just with with playing Peter that you were like, okay, he, he jumps into my head or she jumps into my head, or is it kind of when you're starting that out trying was, to build that, a character? Yeah, that was just people jumping into my head. Um, <laughs> yeah. or, from like sto or from like stories that I've heard or things that I've seen, I was like, that seems a bit like that. Um, I don't normally do that. I don't really have a like a set process, which is something I was going to ask. Like, in terms of you said earlier that you read the book over and over again, is that something you do yeah. with the script as well? And are you like, or or do you kind of let the script kind of find itself on the day a little bit? Yeah, I think. See, it's interesting because I don't really have a clue what my process is yet. But it, I, I think I feel like I have a better understanding of it when I'm working on stage because the process is kind of set up for you already you do like your preparation in advance but you also have that kind of wonderful f four to five weeks rehearsal of like working on like breaking the scenes down in minute detail and uh with this it was probably born out of pure terror that i was like okay i'm gonna read this book as much as is humanly possible but i do I, I think i do like to um refer to the source material be that in this case a book or if it's the play I, I, I like to read that as much as I potentially can before I go into the room because ultimately I'd be of the opinion that generally if all else fails the writing is the thing that supports you and I think that's kind of maybe motivated my choices or ideas about what I want to do next because I, I, I've known I've experienced what how good writing can hold you up to a certain extent. So yeah, I kind of just attack the writing as much as I can. Yeah, Other I mean that's that, I, that's the nice thing about being an actor when it's when it's good when it's when the writing is good and you've got great direction and everyone around yeah. you is kind of just lifting you up. You can kind of get away with doing nothing. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like you're just cheating <laughs> it's like you just look around and you go alright everyone else has got this and you can just kind of jump on the coat oh isn't that the worst feeling though on set when you feel like and I don't know I think some actors do it as well where they show their preparation in conversations and that terrifies me do you know when you're like okay have I, how many times have you read it I've read it uh, uh, but do you know that feeling when you can you can see everyone's work actively happening and you're like oh I don't, I don't know what mine is yet yeah, but I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because I, I'm the same as you, I don't have a process, I kind of make it up each time depending on, on the character and also the people you're working with, you know, some people like to rehearse a lot, directors have different approaches and, um, yeah. 
so I kind of make it up each time, but I have found that, I don't know, the, the, the times that I've really prepped and gone into it, I don't know if mm -hmm. it's necessarily always translated to the screen because I think then I'm carrying all that with me. Yeah. In a way that's oh, beneficial. yeah, you're, that's the thing. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're trying to bring the work from the preparation to the screen. And ultimately, I think that potentially might shut you off from the, at the time, as you said, between action and cut. Can I ask, this is a, a, a slightly, well, not an odd question, but something that I'm intrigued by with actors because mm -hmm. people do different things. But when you're playing um, emotions and within the scene, are you, what's, are you completely within the character? You know those people that kind of, they use their own memories is what I'm trying to, and, and use those yes, to kind of no, I, project emotions. Do you yeah, do that or not? No, I, 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 I'm not saying that I never would, but it wouldn't be something that would interest me at the mo at the moment because I think ge generally I find I get I'm having most fun when I'm trying to uh, think in the way that I think the character is thinking and, and therefore trying to feel the way I think the character is feeling because ultimately the way you feel is ulti I think this is my TED talk is that the way that you feel is basically an expression deeply private to you and therefore I think you're doing the character a disservice if you're trying to put your stuff onto it. I think there's whenever you're playing a scene you go oh I, I remember something similar like that happened in my life or, or didn't and I think it's important to acknowledge that but I think in preparation and in filming I think it's way more interesting to try and adapt or approach how you think the character would emotionally respond to something. What, what about yeah. yourself? Yeah. Well, I think I'm I'm in the same boat. I, I try not to use my own memories because <laughs> I don't know because it, I feel I feel as though then it cheapens my memories in a way. And, I, and there's only totally. like if I have to cry in a scene, I don't want to keep on thinking about something that makes me sad. Christ and then one day be like, oh, I can't cry in the scene anymore. Um, yeah. But then that, yeah. So I try not to do that um, and just base it on the character. But I find it interesting because everyone has different approaches to that, and some people kind of really go into their their, their own, I guess it's kind of a therapeutic thing in some levels. Yeah, totally. And, and like the the weird question, and I hate, but like crying on cue, is it something you can do or is it something that like you just, I know it's, I, it's, it's, I, can't, I definitely can't do it. And there's I'm always weird, really jealous weird, of people that can just. There's like an odd thing with crying on cue. It's, it's always the worst when, and I think um, a director friend of mine, Drake Doremus, really helped me with it because he was saying, it's it's always like stifling for an actor when it's written in the scene like they begin to cry or they cry or what they oh, wipe a tear God. or whatever because then <laughs> you're not then it takes you out of that like being the emotion of what you're doing it puts you into this place of like all right now I've got to try and force myself to cry and like I don't know yeah. I guess that thing of people were saying like you know, most of the time when you're crying you're trying not to cry is a helpful thing to think of but also it's like and he and Drake really cl like cleared it up for me he was like you just feel the emotions. And if, if you cry, yeah. then you cry. But if you don't, it doesn't matter. People will still see that you're feeling totally. emotions. And that kind of suddenly... So yeah. I always I kind of always precursor scenes now when, um, when I'm meant to cry. I kind of give myself a little bit of a safety net where I say to the director beforehand, I'll be like, yeah, I might cry. But I might, I I might, might not. I might cry, I might not. And then I, you <laughs> I'm know, I'll, stealing I'll that. I am totally as as stealing that. <laughs> but it's like... And that, and that <laughs> actually weirdly kind of frees me up in a way where I'm like, I'm actually... I've kind of double-tricked my double bluff my brain yeah where i'm more likely to cry because i've given myself the option not to the opportunity to not yeah and i think like i find i don't know about you but i think slightly audiences and other actors and kind of the industry in general sometimes fetishizes tears or real tears or like not using tears like all of these things i i, I find is always a really interesting conversation because ultimately i think generally you are creating the an, an illusion or some form of an illusion of reality and therefore i don't know you, you do you know what i'm trying to say there's this kind of oh they were real tears or, or look at that actor crying isn't the performance amazing where sometimes the opposite is true sometimes you can see somebody like brutally like bawling and, and, and it just is it, sometimes it can be slightly jarring i don't know what yeah. you think yeah no true. well that's something that actually i wanted to go back to you 
about is the the um the therapy scene that you did is one of the most beautiful bits of acting I've ever seen. Like um, throughout the series, you're amazing. <laughs> but that I wanted to ask about that and and the setup going into it, and also I don't. Um, this is more a technical question, I guess. Again, but also is that something that you had all the emotions like kind of built up by that point that you were ready to release them? And so because that shot's kind of that top shot looking down on you a little bit, and I wondered if you shot that first and then pulled back to the wider. Oh, or, it was an absolute. Mm. Yeah, so this is a bit, a bit of a long story and I don't want to bore you, but basically we did this. Um, so Hetty MacDonald direct directed the second block and uh, she was how many, incredible. How many blocks were there? Sorry, I wanted to ask that question. Two, 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 blocks, two blocks. Two blocks. Okay, yeah. so Lenny did the first three and then... Lenny did the first and then Hetty MacDonald did the second. So, so, on, so we finished the first block on, say, like a Friday and we had Hetty, had a, we all came in to do a read-through of episode 7 to 12. And like, I was like, episode 10 is the one that I was probably scared, like I was terrified of it, to be honest, for for a lot of, it's actually no, so me and Daisy did a read through just ourselves that morning and the rest of the cast came in and we did a big read through. And we were reading episode 10 and um, Aina Hardwick, who plays Rob in in the show, the, the actor who, the, the character who, who commits suicide but he is also a very close friend of mine in real life. And we were sitting in this like really intimate, like small circle and we were reading through episode 10 and I wouldn't be a big crier in general in my own life. And I remember being like, Oh, this is like, this thing is happening in my throat. And we got to the kind of therapy section. We got to the section when Connell says, uh, um, he's, he's talking about not fitting in and that, he doesn't feel like people like him. And I just, for me, that was always the, the line that made me desperately sad. I remember looking up at Aina and Aina's, Aina, Aina would be similar to myself, this kind of stoic Irish, like we don't cry, men don't cry, like that kind of, like not that, but it's, it's a kind of inherent quality, I think. I remember looking across at him and he was bawling. And then I started bawling. And then that, that moment, I thought nearly completely screwed me over in terms of, when we had to shoot it because everybody hits, everybody was like, Oh, Paul started bawling in that scene. And I, it was a pressure that I put on myself because I, I felt like I'd done a kind of vast amount of work at that point. I played him for two and a half months and I felt like I know what's motivating him in the script to be upset or I knew it was motivating those things, but that the closer we got to shooting it, the more I wanted it to go further into the call sheet. And Rob is gone, and I can't, I can't see him again. <laughs> I can't get that life back. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah, we did the read through, and that kind of because there had been such, a, and it wasn't even like it was just there was a big kind of emotional reaction in in the room at the time, and I remember feeling like oh. I felt this kind of internal pressure to re-deliver that. And I'm kind of aware that that's a really dangerous place to be as an actor. Um, so then like we started into block two and I was aware that that, that scene thankfully was quite late in, 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 in the block. And then we got to it and there was like a really, there was quite a solemn atmosphere on set that day, which wouldn't have been typical for that set. It was like lots of fun, lots of great characters on it. And then I remember Hetty asked whether, whether we should start wide or in tight. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. And I think that my reasoning behind it was, I was like, let's start out wide, let's build into the day. But ultimately I think that was a mistake in hindsight because I felt at that point, I, as you referred to, I was kind of ready to blow. I think I'd done loads of work on it and uh, and so the first wide shot, I absolutely like broke down, made an absolutely holy show of myself. And uh, it was like in, in the wide, and, I, and I'm never an advocate of actors who like save your performance for the, the tight shots or play, play in the, like I think you absolutely have to strike a balance. And I was like, okay, great. We've got one take in the wide where everything felt like it connected. And then as the camera started pushing in, I was like, oh, nothing's happening. I feel really disconnected. I feel 
not nothing like you know you know that feeling when it, everything just kind of yeah it's a scary it's a scary thing when you feel like you've done it and then you've lost yeah. it and you're like that was it and then that was it it right. just happened like, and it's, you gone. can't I know just you like, can't then try and chase to recreate because that makes it worse yeah totally and then so H Hedy again was amazing and I was working with um, Noma who is an extraordinary extraordinary actress and she she was only on it for one day and we Hedy after each uh, take be like okay go out have your cigarette take a break like get a get a get a breath of fresh air and i remember it was like say another four or five hours later and we turned around and stuff and then they came in for the kind of like like uh close-ups and i was like okay let's just do it but like i remember saying to myself you've done the work it's not like you're here and you don't know what you're thinking or talking about. I was like, okay, and I felt really ready, and it just it just clicked again, and it was the most it was the most relief I think I've ever felt in my entire life because I feel like that scene is hugely important not only to Connell but it's representing a theme that I'm deeply interested in as as a person. I think men generally don't talk about mental health issues as much as they should, and I. I had the opportunity to do that and it wasn't happening during the day and I was like don't mess this up and thankfully I it, it seemed to click again and I'm ultimately really proud of that scene not a, like particularly in terms of the writing and, and, and where it sits in the show and where it I feel like it should sit for like young men in general in terms of thinking and thoughts on mental health yeah, yeah, man, no, kudos to you because I know that watching that character, if I'd had that character to watch when I was younger, it would have been a great influence on me in life. So that means a lot. And it's interesting for T, you say that about certain lines of dialogue being very like triggering because I've had yeah, that before where I'll look at a line on the page and I'll know that's the one that like cuts right to the core. And I'll be like, I know the second I say that on the day, that's the thing. It will come out and that's, and it's weird. And I, don't, I don't know what it is about, there's something about that line that just, um does it um uh i guess my next thing i wanted to ask is once you wrapped how you felt about first first seeing the show um how you feel about watching yourself and how you feel about the reaction to it so far and i mean i don't want to ask that question of like did you expect it to do this well in this <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I mean, like what's it what's it been like and yeah yeah it's um so I found it really difficult to adjust to kind of normal life after we finished, not, not in any kind of like drastic or dark way. I was just like, oh, this is somebody that I've spent, th this, this is like somebody that I've played and been with for five months, six, like not including the kind of prep time. And then obviously incredibly close to Daisy and the cast, the, the rest of the cast and the crew. And then suddenly like you finish filming and it's like see you, see you later guys and um that was that was tricky for a while and then in terms of watching episodes back and things i th i think i'm better at it than i thought i would be i find i think i think it, i i have nothing else to kind of measure it off but i think with a show like normal people where i felt incredibly creatively valued by both lenny and hetty that I felt like some degree of ownership over it. And I was keen to see what that felt like in reality when I was watching it, because ultimately it doesn't matter what you feel when you're filming it. It's about the end, the end product. And the first couple of watches, I don't know if you feel the same. I don't, do, do you watch yourself back? I, I, I mean, I do, but not like, not, I'm not <laughs> like, oh yeah, I need to watch myself back. I normally find it quite a struggle. There's certain things I've watched and been like, oh, that, you know what? Like, I think you managed to disappear enough into that character. But it's difficult because you do have that perception on the day of what you're doing. And then yeah. there's times when you watch it back and you don't necessarily see that. Like, I don't, I don't totally. watch back when I'm on set normally. Do you watch when you're on set? No, I, 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 I couldn't imagine that. Watching playback. Yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't do that either. But I've worked with people who, who do and use it for their benefit. So it's something that... I've been thinking about where I'm like, maybe I should learn to be more, be able to analyze mm -hmm. myself more like I that. I think I'm probably too insecure to do that. Yet. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I find the process of, I'm envious of people because I think it shows a kind of 
able to it, it means that they have a capacity to totally remove themselves from when they watch themselves in playback so i think if i watched it i'd just be like what does he think he's doing what was that choice and then it, you suddenly just yeah. like it feels like it's a you're a horse with blinkers on the kind of your creative viewpoint just suddenly starts to narrow and, and, and you become um more insecure that'd be my problem well, if i started trying to watch back i'd be, I'd yeah, be like oh, oh i can do that better i'd be like do yeah. do one more and i just keep on going because i know it, most of the time if i see things i'm like i'm not happy completely with what i've done i'm like oh that could have been better or that could have been that you know um so it's an odd thing and what and uh and what about the reaction from people so far has that been uh it's it's been overwhelming it's, great obviously it's been both amazing slight slightly overwhelming in the sense that it just feels very vast it feels like there's a lot of love for the show and you feel i i don't know it's just been kind of a long time a kind of preparing to play him b shooting it and c kind of then talking about him the, the character i mean and the, and, the, and the show but but the response has been nuts like it's been very hard to describe in terms of how positive it has felt maybe i'm missing all the all the nasty reviews and things but it it, I've, I feel like I've been kind of spoiled with this job as in, in terms of an introduction to the kind of um, acting in front of camera and acting on screen. I think uh, I, I couldn't have dreamt up a kind of better job for me personally. Stay. I can't. I don't have class until three. Yeah, but I've got to go home and get some stuff and Niall worries about me. <laughs> That's nice. I like Niall, even though I haven't met him yet. Uh, something I'm curious about in, in regards to you. So you, you, you have a, an incredibly long relationship with the industry for somebody so, so young. And, and my question is how you felt like you've navigated those various stages, A, in terms of your career, but B, as, as you've grown up as Nick. Does that make sense? Like how those two things have mixed and what challenges or kind of joys have come as a result of that? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, yeah, I was fortunate to get like some success as a, as a child actor, but that's a weird thing because then, mm -hmm. you know, you're aware of everyone kind of being like, oh, you know what happens with child actors? So <laughs> yeah. that's kind of a weird thing where you're kind of, I was sitting there and I was like, okay, so you've done all right. And hopefully you continue doing it because I love, love acting and all the things that I mean, I just love that you get to kind of live a, a million different lives and learn all these different things and meet all these different mm -hmm. people. So I, was, I knew that it was something that I wanted to continue doing, but then I was also very aware at that age of the chances are that it wouldn't work out for me to continue. Mm -hmm. So then I just, I, I feel as though it's a lot of luck. I mean, it's, you know, it's that thing of putting in, putting in work, um, but then being in the right place at the right time. So it's kind of, you know, after about a boy kept on working, but then very fortunate to do skins and, and that kind of changing people's perceptions of me. I think that's a thing of like, I've been, I've always tried to kind of never do the same thing or do the same character and let myself get mm -hmm. too pigeonholed. Totally. Um, if I think possible. you've done such, like in terms of watching a career like yours, I, I imagine it's an envy for a lot of actors because of the dex, the dexterity of your ch the choices that you've made and you only get to make those choices if you're a brilliant actor but I imagine that there's been times where you feel like oh this is such this is such a departure and do you, have you ever felt and I, I have a feeling I know what the answer is but have you ever felt a need to protect your career or be conservative in your choices or, or has that ever infect has that ever entered your mind yeah no I've never felt a need to to protect my career because I've never, I've always felt like I'm just, I, mean, I enjoy the risks more um, of taking roles totally. where you go, that, all right, that's tr tricky. But also, I guess, I guess the protective element has come from sometimes reading things and being like, okay, this is a great character. Do I think I can portray it and do it justice? Yeah. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times when you read it and I go, oh, that's exactly what. Yeah. It, just, it just speaks to you and you connect and you go that that I can do and I, I think I can um, is is that generally on a first before. read is that it's generally on often, a first read of a script yeah it's quite often on the first read of something yeah and then and then outside of that it's just a lot of uh, 
being fortunate to work with good people, you know, I was fortunate that after Skins, Tom Ford had seen Skins and uh, after Skins, Tom Ford had seen it and uh, cast me in a single man. And then, so it kind of just, there's like, there's always some sort of, if you look back, it's quite easy to plot almost. Yeah. Um, and at the time you probably feel like your world is changing from like job to job. And you feel like you have some semblance of control over that. Like, are you able to quieten down those moments of excitement so that the lulls in one's career are, are, are slightly less? Because I, I don't feel like I, I'm personally at that point. I feel like every job offer is massive and every no is still cataclysmic. I, I'm curious where, where that sits with you now. It's, that's, a, that's a tricky one. I mean, I remember Colin Firth telling me that there's going to be ups and downs in careers mm -hmm. and you've got, to, you've got to enjoy the highs and appreciate them, but you've got to be prepared for the lows. So it's that thing of, you know, it's, it's great when something, when you, when you work really hard on something and you love it and you, you're passionate and then when people react well to it, but then it's also, you can't let an experience be tainted by if the response to it isn't what you hoped for and expected. So that's kind of, I'm yeah. trying to get that sweet spot of each thing being the experience. And obviously you always want people to like the things you've done, but also you can't do it just for that. You've got to kind of, and that's, I guess the thing, I think I've been very fortunate most of the time that I've managed to work, but also kind of always go and have a real life and have my own hobbies and interests and things that then when it, when it's time to go to work, I can be like, all right, you're not just this guy who goes from set to set to set um, yeah. and is just an actor who doesn't know or do anything else. I think that's, I mean, that's the most important yeah. thing. I think, and I think that feeds both ways. It's kind of, we're lucky as actors, we get to learn weird skills and play different characters and learn about history or people or books and all these things that you don't normally in life anyway. So you can just learn from that and take it in, but also it's kind of our duty to go out and to learn experience. and experience these things so that we can then bring that to the characters as well. Where shall we go now? I have men's things. Madame Georgina Dimov. Empress? Take the Empress to the other ladies and speak of hats. Of course. It may indeed be pleasant to have a wife. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is pleasant. And so how did um, The Great come about for you in terms of the project, the character? Because obviously there's crossover with Tony McNamara writing favorite and I'm curious if that had like if that if that was a discussion that he had with you uh yeah I think it, I, to be honest with you I don't exactly remember the com the conversation <laughs> I remember we did did the favorite loved doing that and his writing and then at some point we spoke about him having this this script of Catherine the Great um and at that point it was a it was a film script um and I read it and loved it and I was I'd like to play Peter um and then the idea, he, he, he had the idea of turning it into a series and then Elle Fanning came up along as a producer as well. And that was where, where it really took off because um, yeah. Elle and T Tony then went out and pitched it to people and, and, um, and Hulu and MRC picked it up. So it was kind of, uh, I was kind of attached from, from an early stage. Those guys made it happen and then I could just like jump in once it got going. Um, uh, and in terms, and that, yeah. something I'm curious about in terms of, so obviously, you and Elle Fanning are, are are the central relationship in it, but it's not the kind of how would I describe it? It's not the like stereotypical. The chemistry is totally relevant, but it's it's antagonistic to each other. But then there's these moments of like, to, especially towards the end, like moments that I was like hysterically laughing at so like seeing Peter's sensibility slightly like creep through in a setting where he's like it feels like he's ill-equipped to express it but he he he, he gives us some form of t tokenistic kind of expression of like when, when he says I'm, I'm having feelings for you in, in, in episode nine and how was it in terms of like that kind of dance between you and Elle in terms of getting that right because ultimately that is similar maybe to normal people it's it's a, it's about these two characters and how they navigate in the world yeah uh i mean luckily Elle and i have worked together before um we did a movie maybe nine years ago um where we actually were in a dysfunctional marriage in that as well um <laughs> so, so that's a running theme when we work together but i think we both from being child actors and growing up in the business and whatever we kind of work in similar ways i think we we our work ethic similar 
definitely. And we both work hard and come prepared. And, and I think we also both, as much as the characters enjoy kind of going at each other, I think we we enjoy doing that as well. Oh, fun. We kind of like okay. pushing each other and seeing where it goes. Um, and that's what's really fun about those two characters going at each other because within those scenes that Tony writes, it's kind of this so many backs and forths um, and switches with who has the upper hand. And, and that's the brilliant yeah. thing about both of them. I think, um, you know, with the way Elle plays Catherine, you get to see her grow and then take, take power and plan this coup, but then you also get to see her be a, a na naive girl. So it's kind of this, she plays this really wonderful balance between the character um, of someone who you're, you're rooting for and passionate about, but then is also well out of their depth at times and, and also doesn't know her own feelings and is figuring that out. And that's the same um, with Peter, the character I play as well. It's kind of that fun thing where he's learning from her and they don't, they don't quite know what mm -hmm. they think of each other at times. They, they know they kind of enjoy being around each other when they're having fun or when they're totally. not. Um, and, that, and that's what's fun about it, I guess. And, and those, yeah, those weird moments where suddenly he tries to open up. <laughs> But has oh, no idea. So, no it's so it. fun though. Oh, it's yeah. so fun to watch. And I think Peter, like when you're watching Peter, and it's something that you do extraordinarily well, it's like the scene starts and you feel like you know what the setup of the scene is. Say it's he's meeting the court and and he has the capacity to like switch on a sixpence. And yes, a lot of that is down like a lot of that's down to the writing, but it, it ultimately rests on your shoulders for us to believe as an audience that this is somebody whose mind, especially when it comes to like matters of political importance or human lives, none of those things seem like real consequences. And that's a really tricky thing to, to like comment on as an actor in those scenes, but you do it, you just do it so well in terms of how trivial you make certain big moments and I think it, it, it's it's amazing comedy but it's also just amazing kind of understanding of character and also, also the style so that's not even a question that's just me saying it's great. <laughs> hey thank you I'll, all right let's keep going <laughs> no that's and that that all goes back to Tony's writing again I can't emphasize like how because I I love that about Peter he, how he can flip and switch on a dime but yeah. it's that thing of I think a lot of the time I don't know if you found this as an actor but you read scripts and they describe characters as being that but then the character yeah. isn't that in in the dialogue or the text or the script directions. So you're suddenly, as an actor, I find this quite a scary place thing to happen, where you're like, you know, that the character has been described as something, but you're not given all the tools in a way, yeah, to do that and portray that. Communicate. And that's that. what. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what's fun and makes me feel very confident in a way in in Tony's writing is that. I see it there on the page, so I'm not just getting a character who's described as that. I see it, so I can then be like, "All right, if you just yeah. go for that, this is what's happening." Yeah. That, that does it. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. And something I like need to talk about is um, Yorgos Lanthimos and the favorite, and just that process in general, because I like that film is obviously extraordinary. I'm curious about your process within that. I'm curious about Yorgos. I'm curious about how that set was and also working with those phenomenal actors um yeah well, this is something that maybe you'll you'll probably know more about in many ways because uh, you you've come from a theater background more right mm, yeah and you're used to having that rehearsal time and I, i'm kind of not so used to that so maybe you know this but like in terms of the prep for the favorite we were very fortunate like, we had two weeks where a kind of core group of cast would meet up and I don't know if you do this in your uh, bit of rehearsals before, but you kind of, we'd all dance together in the mornings and then we'd all stretch and then we'd like hold hands and get into big knots and we'd have to try and figure out how to get out of the knots and then, mm -hmm. and then we'd run the, the script kind of as a play, I suppose, um, where you, where you so see the scene would it you just have, like, be physical game. Your boss. Would it just be your boss and the actors? It, it was a very private... Or would there be like it was Yorgos? There was a there was a choreographer. Or, Tony would be in yeah. the room. Um, so there was a few people. There was a few people there, but yeah, very private. And you kind of just made a fool of yourself, and you tried to do the scene yeah. whilst someone was like dancing behind the person you were talking to, and you had to copy so the dance boring. routine. Like, do you do a lot of that in in the theatre prep that you've done? No, it's probably the key. It's probably how. <laughs> one would imagine it, but it's. I, I did. A, I would have done a lot of that in say drama school. And I think 
generally you, you don't know it, it depends on how directors work i have done that in certain rehearsal rooms but ultimately i think produ productions and things are cutting further back and back on rehearsal time because it's expensive and it can sometimes be deemed deemed expensive to have uh, actors rolling around and knots when the play isn't fully rehearsed yet <laughs> but uh, no <laughs> like I, I, th I think um something like that is incredibly useful at a point where you're taking and this is purely me observing that from the outside, but you're taking incredibly successful actors and directors and, 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 and a, an amazing script. And ultimately, I think something like that, an ex exercise like that, remove ego or they remove the capacity to feel embarrassed. And I think when those things are removed, personally, I feel like that's when you can, and also, as you said earlier, when you're having fun, that's when your work feels like most dexterous. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, completely. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Those are kind of all the points I was going to make about that process. Probably is like it does. It frees you up to then also you've you've delivered the text so many times in so many weird ways, doing all these things yeah. that by the time you get to set, there's a there's a freedom where you've done it and you can just kind of throw it away and it doesn't it doesn't matter in too many ways. Um, so there's a I think I think that process obviously helped me a lot, particularly since it was Tony's writing again that going into the great I was like okay I've had that process so if I kind of we didn't have as much rehearsal time on the show but I was like all right I've had that experience so I kind of know roughly where the, you want to pitch the, field the world of it. The, yeah the field yeah. I'm playing on so I'm like okay mm -hmm. I get that and Yorgos on set's brilliant he, he kind of lets you do your thing he'll 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 rein you in and it's interesting watching his films back because then then I'm like oh okay I see kind of where in hindsight he doesn't give too much away on set but then mm -hmm. But then you see it on the screen what he was aiming at and his his viewpoint. Um, so it's just one of those people that's like thinking on a level way above you can that you can function on. But yeah, he's, he's also yeah, yeah. you just have complete yeah. faith and trust in him that you're like, I know he's not going to make me look bad. So I'm like, I'll yeah. do anything that you want. Um, and then yeah, and then I was very fortunate to be there watching those actresses as well because then I could kind I I can watch them play beats that then like watching Olivia Coleman play Queen Anne, I was like, oh, I could kind of steal little things from how she yeah. played that character for, for relatable things to play Peter, because obviously I've never been an emperor or been a monarch or a <laughs> really? royal family, but I've seen <laughs> one of the great actresses do it. So I'm like, all right, I can just kind of steal yeah. like that petulance or whatever it might be from her that I, I really enjoyed in her performance and be like, I'll have a little totally. sprinkling of that in here. Oh, steal! Like I'm, I'm a big advocate of like steal, 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 steal all the time. Steal, steal from the best. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, I want to ask you quickly about uh, social media. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of followers now and um, influence through that. Um, but also, I, want, I, I guess also I wanted to ask you about how you feel that that presence maybe affects you as an actor. Because I was I was dubious about going on it. For a while because i was like yeah. do i want anyone to see any of my personal life ever or know anything about me because does that detract when they see me on screen from the characters that i'm playing so yeah how do you feel about it what's it been like now interacting with people and yeah he, I, like, I have loads of thoughts on it like consi considering the kind of context of the world that we're living in at the moment it's a very different world that we were living in when i first went onto instagram and, and ultimately i'm talking i was talking to far less people than i am no, but I, 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 I've always liked Instagram. I, I like, see, I like photography. I like photos. I like seeing my friends' lives, and typically in a, in a world like this, which can be quite busy, I do enjoy it. I, and also, I, I can, I think I have a slightly warped understanding of it at the moment because the response to the show has been, I, I feel very positive. I've, there's been like a lot of love from fans of the show, and. But I'm also aware if that wasn't the case, you would be so susceptible to neg negativity a lot of the time. And that's something that I'm not good at in, at negating. Like, I don't know if I have a strong enough or, or a tough enough skin yet to be like, I'll read 10 nice comments, but the, I know the nasty one will be the one that'll percolate in. That's the one that I'll see and, 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 and reprocess. And I suppose the other thing that I find interesting now, it's something that I feel like I have to adjust to in a certain sense, because 
I feel an obligation simply due to the fact about to the amount of numbers that view my social media but there's an obligation given the climate of the world at the moment politically a real obligation to politically be active I think that's a that, that's a responsibility that I, I personally feel and it's a and it's about not being not being um what's the word not being passive in a situation like this because I feel when you have that access and you can reach that amount of people be loud is my like understanding of it but, but with that I think it's it's important what messaging you are putting out but also it's a it's social media is a personal thing as well so it's it's something that I'm figuring out but I, how do you feel about it because you've obviously been, that's been in your life for longer it's very i mean i agree with you it's very tricky and there's there's times like these that we're living in where you can't stay where you can't use it politically or to give your opinion or, or use your voice and your platform um that's obviously a tricky thing because you're going to get a lot of people giving opinions back and forth um but also i think with me i think i just at the moment i'm deciding to try and use it as a positive example i suppose so uh, great like, yeah I'll try and practice, I guess, what I preach a little bit without being like, you all should do this. I'll just show what yeah. I'm doing to hopefully make totally. a change for good. Um, yeah. And if that if that influences 10 people, 20, however many people, to then maybe potentially do the same and um, look into the same things to learn from or educate themselves on, then that's, then that's the positive that can come from it. And I, I did for a long time think I didn't want... I mean, for, for a long time, I was like, I'm not going to have any social media presence because I was like I don't like that idea and I don't like the idea of people in terms of where you feel like you, you it was something that you were wrestling with in terms of whether you were going to even be on social media or not yeah and then it's kind of a tricky thing I suppose where there is I mean a lot of people will look at it as in terms of you know potentially for jobs that you would go up for in terms of that is something that people now look at um, which is you know, which I think is important to comment on that I think is actually really damaging. Personally, yeah. I think that social media shouldn't, um, but, and that's totally my own opinion, I don't think social media has any influence on the actor that you are. It doesn't have any influence on what you can bring to a character. Yes, on the other side of things, it might have some sort of commercial value in terms of bringing an audience to the film, but I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous precedent to set in terms of yeah, the creator should always be the person who can bring play that character, <laughs> yeah. and make that character the most believable. But sadly, kind of, it's not always, not always the case. So I don't know. And then, and then in my head, I was like, you know what? I, I think just getting a little bit older, I'm like, I, I, I didn't want to use the platform for political things. But then, but then, the, yeah, the more the older I get, and the more I see happening, I'm like, you know, you you've got to otherwise. It's something that I'm. I'm figuring out kind of as I'm going but ultimately whether we like it or not social media is a power in the world and I feel like it's kind of recently been bestowed onto me in a certain sense that like you have access to x amount of people and I think if politically if I feel like I need to say something that is going to be beneficial or something that I can hold my hand up and put my name to proudly and say like this is something that I advocate then I feel like I will I will obviously consider it and but ultimately I think you've still got to be it depends if you are politically active or not but there, there's a responsibility to be proud of yourself after all like regardless of, of, of anything that you this is what you're promoting out into the world because ultimately life is life is very short and when you're in this position I think it's important to capitalize on it to a certain extent so Nick, in terms of something that I'm interested in is how like I've talked about I've talked about the kind of dexterity of your career in terms of like characters you play and, and, and how broad your range has has been and, and is. And something that I'm interested in is about the kind of difference between studio films like Mad Max versus the kind of more independent features that you've done. And do does that affect your approach or your prep or do you approach it the same way? Uh, it doesn't. The studio movies, the independent movies, doesn't really affect my prep. That would still go down to like a personal level. Um, you know, with with something like Mad Max, you, you mentioned it's kind of 
that still felt in many ways almost like an indie movie in prep because George Miller yeah. had so much time and thought and history to each character and he'd send you all these videos like charting the, Nux, the character that I played, his, you know, his birth to the moment we meet him in the film and then his trajectory through the movie. So um, I guess the, the thing is obviously the scale of, of being on set. Um, what does that feel like? I have no idea. What's, what's it like when you know you're on an expensive movie and it's <laughs> what, like, what is that like? I'm thinking of it purely from an actor's perspective. Do you feel a heightened pressure or did you feel the first time that you did a studio film? Did you feel that like, oh, this is a lot it's, of money? It's tricky. I, <laughs> I, felt, I felt a lot of different things. I mean, with Mad Max, it's something where you go, wow, and you go, well, this is a lot of money, but it's also being made in the environment that it should be with all totally. the vehicle. And it's with all, very, it, all that money ends up being making it a better experience for you as an actor and meaning totally. that you can just kind of jump into that environment and use it for your performance. So it's, so it's that. But then other times you end up on a movie where it's all green screen and you're looking around and there's nothing there and you kind of go, okay, I, I guess what's, there will be that, like, a lot of money on screen, <laughs> um, but <the> <laughs> yeah, at some point, for you, to, for you to interpret it, I what's guess it definitely like when I was younger. What's it like acting in front of a green screen? The green screen's weird. It's it's fun in some ways because it really tests your imagination. In a way, you can yeah. you know you can kind of sit there and you can make whatever you want up there in your in your mind's eye. It's, it can be tiring the green it can be kind of a, after a while on green screens you kind of start to be a little bit uninspired because you're like all right <laughs> yeah. acting with nothing in this kind of cube of just hot lights or whatever else it might be um but then that's also like an amazing thing to then see what's put in the, like some because sometimes it's not quite what aligns with your imagination and sometimes it's better than you're imagining it's kind of yeah i guess yeah, almost like reading yeah. reading a book and then seeing it translated to screen or something totally. um and yeah in terms of I, I, don't, I, I don't think I approach it differently. I know when I was younger, I felt to a big serial movie. It depend, and it also depends on if you're like a, the lead in it or if you're a supporting character. But if leading a, a big serial movie, that's a daunting thing. That's a scary thing because you know yeah. there's a fair amount of money riding on it. And that's also then, for me, I find it difficult because it kind of it's a little bit stifling in a way. And it's something that you kind of have to totally. learn, I think, to be able to handle. That's why it's not an easy thing. That's why and how did you it. how did you do that? Like because obviously you've referenced the fact that the pressure innately exists. What that is, it, I imagine, is hard to describe. But is there an element of kind of faking it till you feel like you know your process through that? Because pure, surely the first time you played a lead in in a, in a studio film, you didn't have the tools in which to deal with it if you if you did it now. So how did you navigate that the first time? Oh, I mean, rely, I, I <laughs> relied on everyone. It's tricky because I look back and I'm like, you didn't navigate it that well. Does that make sense? I'm like, you rely on everyone mm -hmm. around you, obviously, and follow their lead. Um, I think that's a tricky thing. I guess ultimately it always comes back just if you can do the best with your character in each moment. There's a lot yeah. of things that are outside of your control, I guess, on a, on a film set in general. So if, as long as you know that when you go to bed that night, you go, you know what, I put it, it was all out there. I guess that's something yeah. that I try and do, depend, regardless of the film as well, is like the the scale, give, yeah. give options, which is an odd thing, I guess, because I, I'm conscious of that kind of editing process, which I want to ask you about mm -hmm. in a second, actually, but I'm kind of yeah. like, all right, well, I, I think we've got, <laughs> we've got that version, which is what I imagined it to be, mm -hmm. and I love having a director say, like, try this, and then we can have one where you just go completely... For free. Off, yeah. Off, yeah, off the ideas, and then you kind of, you feel like you get home, and you go, all right, I tried everything. Although normally I still get home and go, I should have tried that <laughs> when it's yeah. when it's too late. But that's that's something I want to ask you about in terms of the the screen experience you've had in terms of the edit. Is there anything that was left out or anything that was in that you didn't expect? And um, just you, I guess, the understanding of that process as you as you adapt into. It. Yeah, I did something that like <laughs> maybe if I was to be asked two or three projects down the line, but I I, I, <laughs> I kind of just watched it in a blind panic, being like, okay. All the lines came out roughly in the right order. I feel like you, the audience, might may or may not be able to understand what what's going on. But in terms of I like editing, to me feels like wizardry. I don't. I think what they do is magic because I can't. My I don't think my brain works in the way that an editor's or a director's works. Even though it's something that I potentially would like to do at some point, I'm so envious of the fact that they can see 
all of the moving parts. I can basically only see the actors that I'm working with, the script and the director, but they're seeing everything. And the, I, I include the editor in that. So yeah, editors are wizards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. Because there's, there's times, I don't know if you experience this, but there's times when you do a scene and you go, that wasn't working terrible. And then you end up seeing it and you go, oh, it really works. It's a great yeah. scene. Or the reverse <laughs> happened. You, oh, this is something I wanted to ask earlier. When, um, particularly in terms of working with Daisy, is that something that you both would occasionally be like, that's the take? I feel like we got it. Because I know that working with Elle, there'd be times where we'd be like, we felt that we both kind of got into a rhythm and we'd be like, we feel like that's the take. Not saying that was the one that they used or it was a great take, but it was but the you one that yeah, we like, Totally. I think the longer me and Daisy got into the shoot, it was it was just weird. It was like there was a real shorthand in terms of how we would communicate. The, the, the discussions would become fewer and fewer in terms of like the later we got into the shoot, we would just have a kind of weird understanding that this is the way the scene played without even talking to each other too much. And I think the conversation around char character, if I need to articulate this correctly, conversations around character can sometimes like dilute character, if that makes sense, if you over discuss it or if you over explain. And I think what Daisy has in absolute abundance is not only talent, but she's got an incredible instinct with character and she's an incredibly generous actor. And they're like, that's, as I'm sure you are, they're the kind of traits that I definitely love working with people who are just intuitive, playful, but also have an abundance of talent to back that up. So the conversations would become less and less and it just felt like it was this unspoken thing. Like, of course we would talk about scenes and things when when required, and but it just, we got into a rhythm with it, I suppose. I just wanted to, I wanted to ask very quickly, the, what the moments were just before they would call action on set and the the kind of, the, the feeling between you and Daisy in between those moments? Are you, are you, will you be connecting and really in the moment with each other just before? Or are you, are you both people that goof around until the last second? Or how, what, yeah, that moment just before the camera started rolling sort of thing. Yeah, totally. It was, it was something that was never kind of set in stone. I think some days, like say days when it was like high pressure or it was like days when you were doing sex scenes and, and stuff that was just slightly off. We would like to have loads of crack between takes. But again, it wouldn't be, it, 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 I think each day with Daisy has its own like its own specific energy. That's such a fun way to work because you're not set in this kind of working relationship that's that's fixed from day one to day ninety two. So it was um it was really fun and uh, yeah, she just class class person to work with. Good, good, good. Um, I have one last question uh, while you're here. Connell's chain, is that something that you, you wear in, in real life? Is that, is that something that you brought to the character? Is that something that's in the book? Yeah, no, the, the chain is actually in, in the book. It's described by um, Peggy as Argos Chic. So uh, the chain's actually from Argos. But um, it's, it, that's probably a weird thing in and of itself because at the start when like chain has this like cult-like following and you feel like you sl like, lose slight ownership of it, and then it becomes this own thing. But like recently I was like, okay, what can we, what can I do to, to, to use this in some way that, that, that is beneficial. So I'm um, auctioning off one of the like chains that I wear in real life that's similar to Connell's for a charity that kind of deals with themes like suicide and mental health, which are like quite present in the show. And it's just, which, that's, which charity is it? it's a bit nuts. Like it's raised like 53,000 euros and like, a week and that's suddenly when I feel like ah that is the real positive of having people who are interested in you and your work and what you have to say that there, there can be real good that comes out of that and ultimately if it's harnessed in the wrong way real negativity but yeah that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the crack which, the uh, which charity was it you, you auctioned it off at uh, Pieta it's a it's a charity in Ireland that kind of deals with uh that I would have known about growing up unfortunately due to like circumstances in my community around suicide and mental health so that's it's one that i remember seeing at various intervals in my life and being like that's that's the one i'd i'm i would like to help yeah good no I, i've supported this charity called calm which is kind of a similar thing because it's something that yeah growing up as a young man it's something that as you said earlier it's kind of 
talking about emotions, expressing them, all those things that are kind of so important. We don't really, not encouraged always to do, and there's not always the right environment. No, to do. I feel like the tide is slightly shifting though, which is good. Like even conversations like this are, are, are beneficial in some shape, way or form. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad the chain managed to raise some good funds. I'd have been on it if I'd known. <laughs>